I want to first of all thank all of you for coming to church tonight. This is a tremendous Wednesday night crowd. With our rush still over there and TRA across the street, another 400, 450 people across the street, and then to see this great crowd here tonight, I thank you for wanting to come to church on Wednesday night. And aren't we glad to have Brother Cornwell? He's like Daddy, and he's like Goliath's sword. There's none like him. Don't try to preach like him. Don't try to talk like him. Everybody else that'll get you in trouble. But this one here is one of a kind. He's a soul winner. He's a church builder. He's a preacher, and he's my friend. Pastors in Wichita, Kansas. Give him a great hand, Brother Cornwell. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for the invitation to be in Alexandria, Louisiana. It's always a tremendous honor to, to be in this great church with you and uh, with Brother and Sister uh, Mangan and Brother and Sister Anthony Mangan. God bless them. They are very special special people in our lives. I'm sure they're special in your lives. It's good to be here with Brother Terry Shaw, the elders of the church, the Sunday school teachers, the soul winners, and everybody else. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to do something tonight that you're not supposed to do away from home, and that is to preach something that I have never preached before. And, uh, I'm not worried about y'all handling it. I'm worried about being able to get it out. <laughs> Hallelujah. My knees are, are knocking. I'm scared. And um, my wife said, well, don't worry about your knees knocking. It's when they start missing that you have to worry. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, uh, <clears throat> but it is good to be in Alexandria uh, to share a burden with you. I was here just about one year ago about this time and a tremendous service that we had last year, but uh, I'm back again to give you another dose. I uh, want you to open your Bible with me to the book of Isaiah chapter uh, 11. Isaiah chapter 11. I'm not sure that's the right verse. I'm sorry, chapter 28 and verse 11. I told you I was scared, hallelujah. (laughs) Brother Mangan reached over and told me that uh, I was on the internet live, so my wife is at home praying that I be very nice tonight. And I'm gonna be very nice and try to say everything just exactly perfect until I get anointed. Hallelujah. And when I get anointed, God help us all. And if you're a missionary and you're watching this telecast or you're in another church watching this telecast, I am preaching directly to you. Amen. So I won't make any bones about it. Just send your tithe and offerings to me when I get through. Oh, hallelujah. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 28. And I'll begin reading at verse number nine. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Now, verse 10, precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue, Will he speak unto this people? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak tonight on the subject of the evolution of a soul winner. The evolution of a soul winner. You may be seated. Contrary to popular opinion, soul winners are not born. You don't, you're, just, you're just not born 
a church builder. You're not born uh, a soul winner. You're not born a preacher. But rather, soul winners are called of God. And then there is a making process that takes place in their life after they're called. Not everyone that is called to be a soul winner ever really becomes a great soul winner because they do not continue the process of what it takes to become what God wants you to be. Can I have an amen? And so I, I read a pamphlet uh, back in 1971 or 72 uh, that said that 75% of the people who are saved were reached by people that had been in the church six months or less. And I got to thinking about that. It was put out uh, by some of our own brethren. And I realized that many of our churches, they grow for a short period of time because the spirit of enthusiasm is present. And they literally live on the spirit of enthusiasm. But after you've been in a church five or six months or a year's time, you, you get used to what's going on and you get settled with what's going on and you lose that fresh new birth enthusiasm. We sit back and we say, okay, I've done my part now. I've been to church six months. I've won five people to God. And now it's up to somebody else to get saved and have that same enthusiasm and to carry it on. But I got, there, there's something inherently wrong with that. There's something that says there's no reason why that we should ever stop becoming a soul winner. Praise God. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, it said, And God gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some teachers for the perfecting. And so for years, we have taken the King James Version of Ephesians 4 and 11 and said, See, God gave us preachers and teachers and apostles and prophets for the perfecting of the saints. As if though you got to be perfect in your conduct, perfect in what you do day by day. But that's not at all what it says. He gave us the preachers and the apostles and prophets for the equipping. Oh, hallelujah. I might as well forget my note for me. I feel the anointing of God. Let me tell you something. We've got to be equipped for the work of the ministry. Can I have an amen? It is important that if you've been saved six months, you cannot stop or your soul winning because your enthusiasm is gone. You've got to equip yourself to continue the work of God until Jesus Christ comes back again. Praise God. Oh, praise God. He gave apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip us, to teach us, to encourage us to continue the work of God. Praise God. Now, in the book of John chapter 6 and verses 44 and verse four, uh, 65, it talks about no man comes unto God except the Spirit draw him. Amen. Hallelujah. We've got to be drawn by God if we're going to be saved. Now, before I was saved... Let me talk a little bit about before I got saved. I went to high school for four years. And in the four years I went to high school, I got invited to church one time. One time, First Baptist Church of Faraday was having a Sunday school contest. And uh, the young people, if, if they could fill up an entire pew with, with visitors, they would win a bicycle or whatever the gift or prize was. And so the enthusiasm ran high, and uh, somebody said, I want you to come and sit on my pew uh, this Sunday. Uh, I, I want to win a bicycle. And so I went to church one time in the four years I went to high school, and I went because somebody was going to win a bicycle. I am, I'm not against Sunday school contests, and I'm not giving, uh, for, uh, against uh, giving away gifts uh, or, or trying some way to build up enthusiasm. But what bothered me was I was never invited back to church, neither by the Baptists, nor the Methodists, nor the United Pentecostals. 
Four years I went to high school and I took gym class with the Pentecostals. I sit in algebra class with the Pentecostals. I sit in the English classes with the Pentecostals. I didn't know anything about the Pentecostals. I didn't know about the shouting and the talking in tongues and the aisle running and the dancing and the preaching and the God's anointing and healing and miracles and gifts. I knew nothing about that, but I knew that I was hungry for God and yet nobody cared for my soul. Yes, I'll invite you to church if I can win a bicycle. But ladies and gentlemen, the calling of God is greater than just winning a bicycle. Praise God. Towards the end of my sophomore year, I had a precious sister. She was mentally and physically retarded. Her name was Bonnie Pearl. Bonnie Pearl was the gift to our home. Mom and dad uh, had 11 kids, and uh, Bonnie Pearl was right in the middle, and she was just older than I was. And she was God's gift to our family. She was mentally retarded, and she was physically retarded. But yet that child meant more to our family than all the other kids. She had her spot at the kitchen table, and I sat right beside her at the kitchen table all the years that, I, that she was alive and, 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 and I was there. And I helped feed her. I would pick her up in my arms, and I would carry her to the school bus and hold her in my arms and get to school, and I, I would take her uh, to her class. Uh, they had uh, special retarded classes at school, and, and uh, I was responsible to make sure that she got to her class, and I would pick her up in the evening and, and, and in my arms, and I would carry her back to the bus, and after a number of years, uh, uh, it got where she could at least write her name, and, 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 and she got to where she could uh, 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 walk a little bit. And, uh, and, and she was just a very, very special grace of God in our home. And I can't tell you how many times I have thanked God for Bonnie Pearl. And then one day I come home from school, and my oldest brother was, was carrying her to the car in and, and his arms, and, and I didn't know what was going on. And, and, and I run him to the house. I said, what, what's going on? And they said, Bonnie is sick, and they're rushing her to the hospital. And, and so they took her to the hospital. And a couple of hours later, uh, I will never forget receiving that phone call when I answered the phone. And they said, she's gone. Bonnie is gone. And I cannot tell you the emptiness and the hurt and the pain that was in my heart when Bonnie Pearl died. She was only 23 years old, and the doctors had said she would never live uh, past her 10th birthday, but God let her stay in our home for 23 long years, and, 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 and she became such a wonderful gift to us. I remember after the funeral, uh, we had buried her, and, and that night uh, I slept in, a, in the back bedroom, a little small bedroom in a very humble house with two double beds where six boys slept in that little room. And it was, it was hot, and the window was open, and the screen was rusty. And I crawled out of bed, and I knelt down between those two beds, and I looked out that window, that rusty screen window, uh, looking through the sweet gum trees that was outside our window, and a full moon shining. and I will never forget the prayer I prayed. I said, God, I don't know how to pray. I, I don't even know if you're out there. I don't, I don't have any idea where you are, and I can't find you. But, oh, God, if you're out there, would you find me? You know, somewhere there's somebody out there kneeling down between two double beds uh, looking through a rusty window and they're saying to God, I don't know where you're at. I don't even know if you're out there. But if you're out there, oh God, would you find me? I believe somebody else in this room has prayed a prayer, something similar to that. And aren't you glad the day that God found you? Aren't you glad that when God found you? <laughs> Praise God. I thought maybe that God would answer that prayer very quickly. First thing I knew, two years had gone by. And I will never forget the last day of high school. My mom and dad had never been to school with me from the time I was in the first grade till I graduated. For fact, in the first grade, I got on the bus by myself. I went to school and I registered myself. I didn't even know what my name was. So 
the pager came on and the principal said, would Morrell Cornwell please come to the office? Now, this is the last day of school, and I couldn't figure out why. So I walked in the office, and there's my mom and dad sitting in that office. And I thought, oh, God, what did I do now? I mean, my mom and dad had never been to school a day in my life. And he's sitting there with his old khaki pants on, his old felt hat, and mama's sitting there. And, and I walk in, and mama's crying, and daddy's crying. And I thought, oh, God, I, I got scared. And the principal was there, and the school superintendent was there, and the guidance counselor was there. And uh, I had no idea what was going on. And uh, the guidance counselor said, Morell said, uh, we brought your mom and dad in here today, and uh, we want to honor you, and uh, we have a presentation to give you, and that is a full scholarship, books, room and board, tuition, and spending money, five years to Louisiana Tech University. Did I feel smart or what? <laughs> I got that swagger. And I thought, I, I could, first of all, I couldn't believe it. I wanted to go to college. I, I was Somehow I was going to find a way to go to college. And they had presented me with a full five-year scholarship. And uh, I didn't realize the prayer. I had forgotten about the prayer I had prayed two years before. And uh, I went off to college, I will never forget, driving up to the dormitory room, Carruthers Hall, room 414, and I put the key in the door and opened up. And would you believe, out of 14,000 students on that campus, there was one apostolic boy on that entire campus. And God put me in the room with one apostolic boy. I went to college to raise hell. I went to college to have a good time, and God ruined everything by putting me in the room with a first-class, genuine, dyed-in-the-wool, 24-carat, holy roller, praise God. And the first three words out of his mouth was, praise the Lord. And I'm standing there with my blue Bermuda shorts on, barefooted, bare-chested, and I said, praise a who? <laughs> the dude had hush puppy shoes on. He had blue jeans on, long pants. He had a long sleeve shirt on. He had hair oil in his hair, and it was parted and combed. And he looked at me and said, praise the Lord. And I thought, oh, God, of all people to get in a room with a cult, here I am. I had forgotten about the prayer I had prayed two years before. I couldn't find God, but God had a way of finding me. Praise God. Let me tell you something, Pentecostals of Alexandria. God is looking for somebody in Rapids Parish. And he's going to send you, he's going to send me to find that person that wants to be saved. Now, needless to say, I either had to kill him or go to church. I will never forget, I stayed away from him. I came in one afternoon to do my homework, and uh, it was about 7 o'clock in the evening, and uh, that, that, that crazy sucker took a, a prayer rug and spread that prayer rug down by his bed, put his pajamas on, and had the nerve to kneel down at that bed and pray in front of God and everybody. Me. Now, that didn't bother me too bad. I mean, you know, I don't care if a person prays. You want to pray? You know, pray. But when he started calling, I'm trying to do calculus. And I'm studying there, and, and I hear him call, God, I pray that you'd save Morel. <laughs> and the devil rose up in me. <laughs> now look at me. Look how holy I am. You can't even imagine that I used to have a devil. But before you laugh, you need to look in the mirror because you used to have a devil. 
Some of y'all look so sanctified and holy. Somebody needs to turn a tape back and play back what you used to be. You used to have a devil in you. You was bound by the devil. You was bound by the world. You was bound by your flesh. And the Holy Ghost sets you free. Not me. Well, I'm going to tell you, honey, you still have a devil. And I got up, and I walked over to where he was praying. He had his eyes closed, and I had a clear shot at his rib cage. And I was, I was going to kick him through that brick wall. And I don't know what stopped me from doing that. I mean, he made me so angry, and the, the devil rose up in me. And I walked out of that room, and I slammed that door, and I shook an eight-story dorm. But about 2 o'clock... I figured I had to have some sleep, so I came back in the room, and he was asleep, and I laid down on my bed, and my eyes popped open, and God said, remember your prayer. Remember your prayer. You couldn't find me, but I have found you. And God used that roommate to teach me a Bible study, and he won me to God. Now, I want you to hear me. He won me to God. A man won me to God. I hate to tell you this. It's embarrassing to tell you this. But I am the only soul he ever won to God. But look what a Lulu he won. It's important to understand that God doesn't want us just to reach one and then fall by the wayside. He wants us to learn. He wants us to grow. He wants us to evolve into a great soul winner. If you've won soul before, I congratulate you and I honor you. But friend, life is not over yet and God is not through with you yet. Praise God. You say, well, I was enthusiastic back then, and I was on fire for God back then. I believe we ought to be able to win souls when everything's going wrong. I believe we ought to be a soul winner when everything's going right. I believe we ought to be a soul winner when we don't have a dime in our pocket. I believe we ought to be a soul winner when our pockets are crammed. You say, Pastor, I've already lost my enthusiasm. It's not about just being enthusiastic. It's about knowing who God is and knowing what God has for our lives. So I got saved. My first roommate in college. When I got saved, I had so much enthusiasm that I became known as the preacher on campus. Because if I could corner you, I was going to lay a witness on you. I didn't have any knowledge. I didn't even own a Bible. My roommate would leave his Bible on his desk, and I would steal it. And I would read it. And then I would return it. I didn't have $10 it took to buy a Bible. I mean, I was a college student. I was on a scholarship. Didn't have no extra money. Mom and dad didn't have no extra money. And, and, and I was just hanging on by a thread. And, but I, I would borrow his Bible, and I would read it. And everywhere I went, I talked to people about what happened to me. I got the Holy Ghost. God, filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I spoke in other tongues. I got baptized in Jesus' name and didn't have a clue what Jesus' name meant. But God had found me. And you know, the more I studied, the more I realized that other people had to get saved. And so I wanted to become a soul winner. And so I started a dorm devotion. At 10 o'clock at night, they gave us permission to turn off the television sets for 30 minutes during the newscast. And I could have 30-minute dorm devotions. And, and the first thing you know, all the other dorms was coming over to our dorm and on our floor. And, and we was having a knockdown, drag-out debate. I mean, you know, when you get the Holy Ghost, all you got is a testimony. 
And when you have to steal somebody's Bible to learn a little bit about the Bible, you don't learn a whole lot. And so I, I tuck my tail between my legs and go back to my room, and I'd have to do some more studying. I'd wait till he'd get to sleep. I'd steal his Bible, and I'd read and read and read and read and read. And the next night, I'd go back to dorm devotion and get licked again. And uh, I'd go back, and I'd read and read and study and pray and get licked, and I'd go back again. And I kept going back. And after a while, I learned a little bit about the Bible. And the first thing you know, I started winning some of those college kids to God. The last year I was in college, I won and baptized 29 college kids in one year at the University of Louisiana Tech. Some of them are preaching tonight, and some of them married preachers, praise God. Let me tell you something. you got to be a soul winner and you can't do it on your first love and just getting saved and your enthusiasm you got to learn how to do it now just be patient with me for a few minutes the evolution of a soul winner and so uh, I started dorm devotions and, and 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 God was just he just kept blessing and uh, and then uh, I, I, I I started Bible studies or, or semi-Bible studies on the campus. And the church I was in, God help us, it was a small church that was getting smaller. Uh, let me see if I can say this politely. Uh, how can I say this without being offensive? I can't say it without being offensive, so I'll just say it. The preacher lacked a brick having a load. I mean, he'd pick fights. And I brought six college kids to church one night, and they, and they had a big knockdown, drag out fight right in the middle of church. And, and I mean, how do, you have, how do you bring people to church when the church goes down from 120 down to 35 or 40 and, and it's fighting and, 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 and there's two or three families that run everything and, and if you don't please the families, you're just out. And, uh, but there was a young man in that church that was an ex-gang member. He lived in San Antonio, Texas, and he ran with the wild gangs on the west side of San Antonio. One night he had a, 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 a car accident, a fender bender, and he got out of his car, and another gang jumped out of their car, and they beat him with tire iron, tire tools, and they left him for dead on the sidewalks of San Antonio, his brains laying on the sidewalk, and they left him for dead. But this, this man had a Pentecostal wife, and they rushed him to the hospital, and they laid him on the table. They was not expecting to live. He had a huge hole in the side of his head. Part of his brains uh, were missing, and, and, and his, the, the hole in the side of his head was large enough that you could put your fist inside his skull. And, uh, and they, they brought his wife to the hospital, and they weren't going to do anything because they knew he was going to die. And she got to pray, and she said, no, he can't die. God said, I'm going to save him, and he can't die till he gets saved. And the doctor told him, said, look, said, even if he lives, he's never going to regain conscious. He's going to be on life support the rest of his life. He said, no, no, I can't accept that. God said that he was going to save my husband. He's going to save my husband. This husband had, gotten, had gone so far down that he had a full-length tattoo of the devil on his chest. Had it tattooed on, on, on his entire body, the picture of the devil. And, and that's how far he had gone. He had gone into to, to swallowing lighter fluid and blowing flames and, 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 and every kind of drug that you could possibly imagine. I mean, the, the guy went so far down that there was no way to even see the bottom. And now he's almost dead, and God raises him up, and, 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 and he can't walk, and, and his wife keeps praying, and they finally get him where he can walk in a full body brace. He, he's, he, he's a man of steel. And, and he's paralyzed in exactly half of his body, and, 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 he, and he, he drags that body around with all those steel braces on him. And, and for some reason or another, they show up in the church at Ruston. And so one day, I received a phone call from Bobby, and he said, uh, Morell, he said, would, would you come get me and take me to church? I just need to pray. 
I said, Bobby, I ain't got time to come out there and get you and take you to pray. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm studying engineering. I got calculus and math and chemistry and all these kind of things, and I'm busy, and I don't have time to, to, to. He said, please. He said, nobody in the church has any time for me. He said, would you just please, just, just one day, just come get me and let me come to church and let me pray at church. I said, all right. So I got in my car, and I drove out to his house, and it was a mess trying to get him loaded up in a car. I mean, he was nothing but steel and brain races and I'd get him up in the car and he was taking heavy doses of phenobarbital to keep down uh, the seizures and, 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 and he can't walk and he's a simple and he can't read, he can't write, he can't do nothing. And so I go get him and he said, okay, look, I'm going to let you pray one hour and, and, and then we're going to go. And so uh, he would go and he'd start praying. And man, I'd pray. I'd pray 10 minutes like the world was on fire. Then I'd run out of stuff to pray. I mean, I ain't pray for the whole world in three or four minutes. And he'd be over at the altar end, and he'd pray, and he'd pray an hour. And I'd go get him. I said, Bobby, it's time to go. He said, just a minute, let me pray a little bit more. And so he'd pray three hours, and I'd pray 10 minutes. And so the next day, he'd call me again. Morel, he said, would you come get me to pray? I said, no, I'm not going to get you to pray. You won't come when it's time to come. I, he said, I promise you, I'll pray one hour, and I'll go this time. So I'd go out there and get him, load him up, bring him to church, and he'd pray three more hours, and I'd pray 15 minutes. And he'd call me the next day. Would you come get me to pray? I said, oh, God, why can't my phone be busy when he calls? Why can't I leave my phone off the hook? And, and, and after a while, he got where he'd pray three hours and I could pray an hour. And he got to where he'd pray three hours and I got to pray an hour and a half. He got to where he'd pray three hours and I could pray two hours. He got to where he'd pray three hours and I could stick with him word for word and prayer for prayer. Hallelujah. One night, one afternoon in that prayer, in that prayer meeting, he got to trying to stand up with all the metal and braces on, and, and I heard him talking in tongues, and I was talking in tongues, and wheelies were going up my spine, and my hair was standing up on end. He said, Morel, he said, he said, I feel God. I said, I feel God too. Hallelujah. He said, the Lord spoke to me. I said, what? He said, the Lord spoke to me. He said, if I would knock every door in this city, he would heal me. I thought, wait a minute, that's going off the deep end. I mean, the guy, the guy can't walk. He's dragging half a body. And he can't read and he can't write. And the church can't afford to buy no tracks because they're too busy fussing and fighting. Guess what? I had to spend my extra spending money on buying tracks for him. So I bought him a bunch of tracks, and he started knocking on doors, dragging a half a body. He knocked on every door in the city of Ruston, Louisiana, 25,000 people, and he drugged that half a body. He got doors slammed in his face. He got cussed out. He got everything done to him, but he kept on knocking doors. Let me tell you something. I was evolving as a soul winner. I had learned how to pray, and now God said, I'm going to teach you how to knock on doors. I'm going to teach you how to love people. Let me tell you something, church. We got to learn how to pray, and we got to learn how to knock doors, and we got to learn how to love people. Hallelujah. One night during church, he took his phenobarbital and he flushed it down the toilet and never had another epileptic convulsion. One night, he stood up to testify, and it takes him five minutes to stand up with all those braces on. He couldn't walk. He couldn't move without those steel braces all over his body. And I heard the awfulest racket. He was shucking all that steel, all those braces, and he threw them in the floor. And he stood up, and he walked. Praise God. And God started healing him. Let me tell you something. God wants you to become a soul winner. And there's no telling who he's going to bring into your life to help you on this evolutionary process. You've got to evolve from just a pew. I said you've got to evolve from just a pew to the streets in the homes of people in this city. God wants Alexandria to have an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. 
You say, wait a minute, preacher. We're already one of the biggest churches in the country. It's not a matter of how big you are. It's how many people that's left out there that's not saved. You can't hide among the stuff because God is going to search you out. He needs soul winners in this hour. Somebody said amen. So I got saved. And uh, now, I got got a question I'm going to ask God when I get to heaven. I'm assuming I'm going to get there. And that is... Why it took God so long to call me to preach? You realize I had the Holy Ghost 20 minutes before God called me to preach. I don't understand that. I mean, I thought God was pretty decisive. But it took God more than 20 minutes to decide whether or not I was called to preach. And... uh, so, I got called to preach. You know, it's one thing to be called to preach if you're a preacher's kid. And it's another thing to be called to preach if you're the pastor's best friend. Or you know somebody. But when you don't know anybody, you're on your own. Live, die, sink, or swim. No guts, no glory. And so, I'd go to every little church out in the country, didn't matter what color they were or what denomination they were. I'd walk in and announce I'm called to preach. (laughs) Hallelujah. Now, those first few sermons, sometimes I thought God had made a mistake. And I got called to preach. And then the Lord really did deal with my heart. And uh, I was a junior in college, and I almost made a decision to go off to bridal college. I mean, Bible college. <laughs> little Greek there. And uh, I talked to my dad. And my dad's a very humble man, and I loved my dad very dearly. My mom and dad are were just a first class people and I was the first person in the history of my family to ever go to college and he said son he said if God calls you to preach he said can he just wait until you get your degree and I, I said you know I think that'd be pleasing to God so I sent my application into Christian Life College in Stockton and knowing what I know now This is a miracle. But Brother Clyde Haney put my application on his desk, and it became lost among the stuff. And I never heard from him. And I thought, that really hurt my feelings, so I decided to get my degree. So I finished my degree, and a number of years later, I was preaching for Brother Kenneth Haney at Stockton. And uh, the president of Bible school came up and said, Brother Cohen, we have found your application. We have found your application. And do you still want to go to Bible college? I said, I'm preaching in a college. Why would I want to go? Hallelujah. And uh, needless to say, praise God, uh, I got called to preach. And I finished my degree, which was the will of God. It, it, it just was the will of God. And I started evangelizing. A little church here and a little church there. And, You know, I I wasn't good enough to preach in big churches. And so I had to preach wherever I could preach. And I never will forget, I went to preach in my home church, and uh, my dad came to hear me. And the next night I went to preach, I sat down on the front porch, and my dad said, look. He said, I've got one piece of advice for you. I said, okay, what is it? He said, make sure they take up the offering before you preach. He said, if they wait till after you preach, you'll starve to death. <laughs> I went preached in my wife's home church, and, and, and my mother-in-law, well, she heard me for the first time, and she bowed her head and just shook her head and said, my God, my daughter's going to starve to death. 
But I kept on, and, and uh, so I, I, I felt like the Lord was calling me to California. And so I ended up in Miami Beach, Florida, and... Uh, Folks, that's ain't funny. <laughs> I was staying in a $14 a night hotel room in Miami Beach. So you can imagine how many rats I was sharing the room with. And uh, I had one wooden nickel to Sambo's. You could buy a cup of coffee for a wooden nickel. And I walked into Sambo's and, and I ordered a cup of coffee. And there was a pastor there. He said, uh, are you Morel Cornwell? And I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, sit down here, son. I want to buy you breakfast. Now, I have a policy. If anybody wants to feed me, i let them. Especially when you're hungry. And he said, I want you to preach me a revival. I said, how do you know me? He said, well, somebody told me you preached down in Picayune, Mississippi. Had revival in Picayune. And I figured if anybody can have revival in Picayune, Mississippi, can have revival in Oakland, California. I said, California? He said, yes, sir. He said, I want you to come preach me a, a, a two-week revival in Oakland, California. He gave me a date. And I drove from Miami, Florida to Oakland, California, nonstop for one two-week revival. That revival turned out to be a 26-week revival. And God poured out the Holy Ghost. It was in that revival that I began to make great strides in the evolutionary process. Not only was I having to knock doors and bring in strangers to preach to, but I was also having to follow up the people that we prayed through and had to teach them and disciple them. And not only that, I had to get them to become a part of the church. And God was working on this evolutionary process. And then in December of 1973, I made my way to San Diego, California. And it's, I'm sorry, in, in December of 1972, I made my way to San Diego to a Sunday school convention that this lady and this man was preaching at the San Diego Convention Center. And I was sitting on the back row. And, you know, I thought Pentecostals, when you went to church, you listened to the preaching to obey the preach. I didn't know that preaching was our form of entertainment. I thought preachers meant what they said. I thought people understood that the preacher meant what he said. I didn't know that you could go to conventions and because of the times and landmarks and all these conventions because it's the greatest show on earth. Hallelujah. When I go to a convention, I'm going to listen diligently for a word from God. It doesn't matter who is doing the preaching. Now, being a new convert and being a new preacher, I did not know who brother and sister Mangan was. And if you can imagine that, I had no idea who they were. But this, this lady was on the platform, and she was preaching uh, from Mark chapter 11 on what sort of things you desire. If you believe, you can receive them. And I sit on the edge of my pew on the very back row. And, and she kept repeating, whatsoever things you desire, you got to have desire, desire, desire. And it began to work on me. And I felt like that evolutionary process was taking place in my life again. And so when she asked for people to come forward, I stood and like an idiot, I thought, I thought everybody was going forward because they was moved by the sermon. I didn't know that they, that was just part of Pentecostal tradition is that the altar call, go to the front and pray a little bit, squall and snot around, and then get up and go to McDonald's. I will never forget as long as I live. Sister Mangan hurt my feelings so bad. Oh, I could have killed her. I was standing on the edge of the platform, and, and she was praying for people along the way, and, 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 and I knocked on that platform, a, 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 a floor there, and, and got her attention, and I waved her over, and she said, what do you need, sonny boy? <laughs> Call me a sonny boy. <laughs> Didn't she know that I was a Jesus name apostolic preacher? <laughs> no, she didn't know that. I said, yes, ma'am, I want you to pray for me. 
She said, all right, I'll pray. So she uh, motioned for Brother Mangan to come over, and and, and, and I said, what do you want me to pray for? I said, I've just made a decision that I'm going to be the greatest soul winner in America. I made a decision. It was not just emotion. This woman said you can have whatsoever things you desire. And I realized that ever since I'd been born again, I had a desire to be a soul winner. And I made, I made a decision that night to change the way evangelism was done in the United Pentecostal Church. Now, I didn't know what I was undertaking that night. I was just a kid preacher. I wasn't known by anybody. I had one revival. That's all the revivals I had. And I made a decision to become the greatest soul winner in America. And I also made a decision that I would change the face of evangelism in the United Pentecostal Church. I don't care what it takes, God. Use me. And let me tell you something. When God starts that process in you, he will answer your prayer. If you're going to be a soul winner, you've got to make a decision to be a soul winner. Sometimes we just intersect. We just intersect with somebody that wants to be saved. My roommate was not a soul winner. My roommate didn't try to win a soul. He just happened to intersect with somebody that needed God, but he's never intersected with anybody else. I don't want to accidentally run into you at an intersection somewhere. I want to pursue you. I want to reach for you. I want God to equip me to reach somebody for Jesus Christ. My God, the Holy Ghost is in this house. God is calling somebody to make a decision. Somebody, God wants to transform your life tonight to become a soul winner. Amen. From that point on, I preached a sermon here in this pulpit a great number of years ago entitled Sitting Beside the Reaper. And where Boaz told Ruth to stay with her reapers. And the Bible says she sat beside the reapers. I made up my mind to get away from the radicals and the fanatics on both ends of the scale. The super ultra liberals and the super ultra conservatives. I wanted to find somebody that was a soul winner. I wanted to find somebody that loved God. I wanted to find somebody that cared about reaching people. I wanted to find somebody that loves people. And I started sitting beside the reapers. And I wanted to learn everything I can learn about winning people to God. Can I have an amen? amen. Let, me, let, me, let me bring this to a close here for just a moment. The Bible talks about in Luke 19 that he went into a far country and he left talents. He had 10 talents. He brought 10 men in, and he gave them a talent apiece. And he said, occupy till I come. And then when he came back, he, gave an, he wanted them to give an accounting. And one man, his gift had produced 10 gifts. And he said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I'm going to make you ruler over great things. Another man, his talent produced five, and so on. And finally, there was one man that had one talent that he'd given to everybody, but he hid his talent in the sand, and he never multiplied his talent. I understand that God gives gifts to men. There are some men have tremendous gifts of making money. Everything everything they touch turns to gold. Some men have great gifts at building, and, and some of their buildings are just phenomenal things they turn out. Some men have all kinds of gifts of mathematics and and chemistry and and those kind of things. But you know, it's not the gift that you're born with that really counts. It's the gifts that you are willing to multiply in your life. When I, when I got called to preach, I was not a preacher. I, I was a very shy person. I was not a soul winner by nature. Uh, I, I, I didn't know what my gifts were. I was good in mathematics. I became a chemical engineer and, and, and got a lot of hours in biomedical engineering. And I, I really thought I was going to become a doctor uh, and a chemical engineer combination. But God changed my mind and became a preacher. But being a preacher is not enough. I don't want to be a great preacher. When I die and they lay me in front of the church, I don't want it to be said, uh, 
that here lies a great preacher because preachers are everywhere and great preachers are everywhere. But I want to be said that the man gave his life to God and became a great soul winner and his love was for people that were lost. Let me tell you, I stand here tonight as an advocate for the people of Alexandria that are lost without God. Somebody has got to multiply your talent. Maybe you're a medical doctor and you're gifted. Why don't you multiply that talent and become a soul winner? I'm going to tell you somebody, maybe a great police officer, and that's great, but you got to be more than a police officer. you got to become a soul winner for Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hallelujah. Am I making any kind of sense? Soul winners, it's not the will of God for people that's been in the church for only six months or less to win 75% of the people to God. You've got to evolve into a soul winner. You've got to become equipped to be a soul winner. Can I have an amen? Some of the greatest trials I've ever gone through in my life. In one stretch of time, I went almost a year and could not feel the presence of God. And I thank God for that year. But even while I couldn't feel God, and I had no eebie-jeebies going up and down my spine. And I was preaching to sinners of every service. I, I, I want to tell you something. I won souls when I couldn't feel God. When I was suffering from great loss, I still won souls to God. When I faced my greatest difficulties, I still won souls to God. It wasn't out of enthusiasm. It was out of the knowledge that that's what God wants for your life. Praise God. I don't know what you're going through tonight, but let me tell you something. You cannot let that drown you. You cannot die through what you're going through. If you'll stand up and say, God, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. I'll become a soul winner, and I'm going to tell you, God will turn your life around, and he'll shake the foundation to clear you of anything. Thing you're going through. Thirteen years after I had the Holy Ghost, I had heard Holy Ghost. Thirteen years, I had my greatest year of soul winning. I got saved in 1967. In 1980, my wife and I picked up a Bible study chart, and we won 109 people to God in 1980. In 1981, we won an additional 106 more adults to God with Bible study. I found out that when this evolutionary process starts taking place, you become a greater and greater soul winner. Praise God. The more you give yourself to God, the more he blesses you. Can I have a witness, somebody? The more you do for God, the more he blesses you. Amen. So I went to Alaska, and I took the camp meeting in Alaska. And uh, I had, uh, I was preaching on Sunday night, and uh, I told my church, I said, I, I was preaching half mad, but a preacher is not a good preacher unless he preaches half mad. And uh, I said, I'm good mind to find a couple and bring them up on this platform and teach them a Bible study and win them to God in front of God and everybody. So I was just preaching. I didn't mean it. It just sounded good. But I had ticked off the wrong person, my wife. On the way home, we stopped at the red light, and she said, if you don't do what you said, you lied to God and the people. Now, Sister Dolly is a very gentle woman. She is a sweetheart. I said, what did I tell the people? She said, you said you're going to find somebody and you're going to teach them on our platform. I said, I, I didn't mean it. I was just preaching. So... I knocked doors for three weeks, and I found a couple that would let me teach them a Bible study, but they wouldn't let me teach them on the platform until I agreed to build their home on my platform. So I cleared off all the musical instruments, cleared out the choir, and I, built, I got my carpenters in there and built their home on my platform and left the front side open. And I said, no, 
you can come to the Bible study. You can't laugh at my jokes. You can't cough, sneeze, or laugh, or make any noise. I'm going to teach this couple of Bible study. I'm going to let you observe me teaching. And so it got so intent that we didn't even recognize that there was people in the audience. Fifteen lessons I taught them on my platform. And when I got through on Sunday morning, they showed up at church. The cameras picked them up coming down the aisle and standing here. And they took them up and we baptized them and they received the Holy Ghost coming up out of the water. And uh, I thought, so the last night of the Bible study, they turned the lights on. There was about 700 people that had come to every Bible study. And I said, is anybody here that, that you've heard me teach, you want to be baptized? I baptized 11 new people from that 15 studies that was in the audience. So I went to Alaska, and I, I sold several sets of tapes. And, and uh, you know, a boy that's used to running top of cotton rows doesn't make sense on the icebergs of the Arctic Circle. So I asked Brother Glover, the district secretary, I said, you and Brother Blackshear need to come to Wichita and put the Bible study on tape in the culture of the Clinkett Indian or the Eskimo. After a year and a half, I finally got Brother Glover in Wichita, and we set up everything, and he taught Bible study in the culture of the Clinkett Indian, all 12 lessons. We made them 50 sets of videos, sent them to Alaska. They called and said, we need more. I sent them 50 more sets of videos. And, and, and Brother Blackshear and Brother Glover have airplanes, and they started taking those tapes in those fishing villages on those dark winter nights. They just, they, they'll just listen and watch anything. And they started watching the videotapes of Brother Glover teaching Bible study in the pulpit in Wichita. And now we have seven churches that have no pastor that's being pastored by a missionary with an airplane because of those videos that was, was taught in the city of Wichita by Brother Glover. It became such a success. And then a couple of years ago, they had a, the big crusade. You remember the, the Philippine crusade? Well, I, I felt a burden. And so I called the, the national superintendent in the Philippines, and he referred me to Jesse Fortaleza in Winnipeg, Manitoba who is a Filipino, and I brought him to Wichita, and he done exploring God's Word in the Tagalog language, and now we have thousands of sets of videos of the Bible study in the Tagalog language all over the Philippines and across America, and, and then that wasn't enough. I thought, if it works in the Philippine language, if it works in the culture of the Clinton Indian, what about the Chinese language? So we brought Brother uh, Timothy Lee from Singapore, Brother Greg Tan, and they done the Bible study in the Mandarin Chinese language. Language. And we compressed it down and got all 12 lessons on two uh, CDs, uh, two, two DVDs, uh, and they smuggled them in their shirt pocket into Beijing. And now there are thousands of sets of Bible studies uh, in the city of Beijing, Red China. And Brother Timothy Lee went back to Singapore, and their church is exploding with revival. Let me tell you something. If you want to be a soul winner, God will make a way for you to become a soul winner. We brought Brother Ragosh from Belarus, Russia, and he'd done the Bible study in the Russian language. We brought Brother Philip Walmer from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and he'd done it in the Portuguese language. We brought Brother Martinez in, and he'd done it in the Spanish language. Let me tell you something. We got it set up now where it's going to be in French and Korean and Japanese. And I'm working with Brother Howe that every missionary that comes home on the field can come and do his Bible study in his own language in this field. Let me tell you, it's time for us to realize that it's souls that's at stake around the world, not just in Alexandria. Let's all stand. I mailed out 10,000 letters to try to find a Bible study. I received a phone call from Rosie Hughes, and uh, we went to visit her. She said, you got a, in your letter that you teach Bible studies, we'd like to have a Bible study. I said, where'd you get the letter? She showed me her letter. It wasn't even addressed to her. It was the wrong address. The postman put one of those 10,000 letters on the wrong door. And I started teaching Rosie Hughes a Bible study. And uh, she said, there's a, another couple that wants to come in. So he brought in an elderly gentleman, 85 years old, and his wife. 
and uh, they were very precious, uh, a black couple. And he was so moved by the Bible study, he said, can I tape your Bible study? So he brings one of these giant ghetto blasters, and I set my chart up right over his ghetto blaster, and I teach them a Bible study, and I end up baptizing five or six families out of that home. So one day, we was having a seminar in our church, and I gave the invitation of those who would commit to being a soul winner. And Nadine Leitzel came to the front. And I thought, she can't read. She can't write. She's a, she's a janitor in a nursing home. And when it was over, she just stood there. So I went down and talked to her, and she said, Pastor, she said, I'd like to teach a Bible study, but I can't read and I can't write. And she said, how, how am I going to do that? And I said, well, Nadine, God will just have to teach you to read and write. And I didn't think anything about it. Three months later, Sunday morning, she walks in the door, smiling like a possum eating saw briars. She's just a humble lady, a little, well, quite a bit overweight, very humble, very, very poor. She walks in with a brilliant-looking young couple. The invitation is given. Nadine reads them down to the front. I step up and I said, can I help y'all? She said, yes. Yeah. She said, uh, we want to be baptized. I said, okay. I said, would y'all take and be baptized? She said, wait a minute, wait a minute. She said, do you baptize in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins? I said, yes, ma'am, I do. I said, y'all take and get ready. She said, wait a minute. She said, does this church teach hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord? Do y'all believe in, in one God? I said, yes, ma'am, we do. I said, y'all take it. She said, wait a minute. She said, do you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost here and speak in other tongues? I'm getting frustrated. I said, yes, we do. She said, I got one more question. She said, do y'all believe in holiness? And I'm thinking, where did they find this nut? I said, yes, we believe in whole. She said, okay, I'll let you baptize me in the name of Jesus Christ. So we took her. And Nadine is standing there. She got her hands on her belly, folded. And I, I, said, I said, where did you find this couple? She said, I'm teaching them a Bible study. I said, you're what? She said, I'm teaching them a Bible study. I said, God taught you how to read and write. Oh, no, pastor. You know I can't read and write. I'm too old to learn that kind of stuff. But she said, I can play a tape recorder. She said, you put all your tapes of teaching Rosie Hughes and Clarence Kendall in the tape room. And I just got a set of tapes. I got to listening. And she said, your, your charts sit right over the tape recorder. And every time you turn a page, you can hear you turn a page on those tapes. And she said, I got the tapes. And, and I just learned when to turn the page. And I just took the, the tapes and the chart to her house. And I turned a tape recorder on. And I just turned the page like I can read and write. You want to be a soul winner? You can be a soul winner. <laughs> Would you lift your hand for just a moment and praise the Lord with me for just one moment. Father, I thank you. I realize tonight, Lord, that this, that this webcast is going around the world to missionaries and, and, and preachers and saints everywhere. And I pray, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, right here with the church in Alexandria, that they can make a decision tonight to become a great soul winner. <laughs> Father, Father, I pray. I pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, Lord, make some soul winners tonight. You said if I would come to Alexander, you said if I'd come here tonight, Lord, that you would raise somebody else up to become a soul winner. And Lord, I'm obeying you now in the name of Jesus. If you have a desire tonight to be a soul winner, I want you to hold your right hand up as high as you can hold it. And I want you to wave that hand to God and say, Lord, I want to be a soul winner. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, it's only about four months to the end of the year. It's harvest time. If, you, if you'll commit yourself and say, Brother Cornwell, I'll do my best to bring somebody to God before the end of the year. I want you to wave your hand to the Holy Ghost. Yes. Oh. 
I want us to bow our head for just a moment. Let me tell you something. There's a young man here. There's a young lady here. That you need to make a decision. You got to make a decision. You got to make a decision that I can become the greatest soul winner in Alexandria. I can become the greatest soul winner in Louisiana. I can become the greatest soul winner in North America. If you're here and God's speaking to you, be you a man or woman, a young person, and you want to become a great soul, somebody's got to take Vesta Mangan's place. Somebody's got to take Morel Cornwell's place. Somebody has got to stand up and say, I can reach somebody. Would you make that decision? Would you like to come and stand here and say, I don't want to be the greatest preacher, but I want to become a great soul winner. I've got to become a great soul winner. I've got to become a great soul winner. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Alexandria, for allowing me to share a burden with you tonight. Thank you so much.